for our first talk, what I wanted to do is, again, how can we provide value immediately? So I wanted to introduce uh, David Schwed, Halborn's COO, and we're going to dive into some questions and have a little fireside chat. So let's get into it. David, how are you doing? I'm doing good. Thanks for having me here. Let's, let's first get started with just, just uh, some intros. So tell us a little bit about yourself, Dave. Sure, absolutely. So I'm Dave Schwed. I'm the Chief Operating Officer for Halborn. Uh, prior to Halborn, I was the Global Head of Digital Access Technology for BNY Mellon. And prior to that, I was the Chief Information Security Officer for Galaxy Digital. And then prior to that, just a bunch of boring shit in TradFi. <laughs> yeah. Um, so again, like we, we put together access to just provide value immediately to the digital assets uh, community. And what are, what are folks seeing out there? What are the biggest risks and security challenges for focusing in as a, as a head of digital assets for you know, it's financial institutions? Yeah, there's a couple of things that come to mind. You know, the, the first one is, you know, this is a new technology, and with new technology comes new vulnerabilities and becomes new attack vectors. And I think the traditional construct that most enterprise organizations are used to in a Web 2 world don't necessarily work well in a Web 3 world. And you need to change the way you look at the different types of technologies. Uh, you know, there was an announcement uh, yesterday or the day before, I, I forget which one, you know, there's a vulnerability in MPC technology and, you know, the entire world is, is losing their minds. Um, you know, when we're looking at digital assets and we're looking at things like MPCs and we're looking at, you know, traditional HSMs, I think what enterprises need to understand is, you know, this is, this is new technology, and with new technology comes new threats, and with new threats comes new attack vectors and vulnerabilities. And we need to look at this technology in the lens of um, there's going to be these unmitigated risks that we're going to come across. We don't necessarily have the time uh, like we did with traditional Web2 technologies where, you know, we have, you know, three and a half years like a traditional bank to stand up this new technology. You know, the, the market is asking for certain things and we have to react in a way for the consumer or, you know, in this case, you know, for different enterprises. So we need to think about technology and especially security in defense in depth. We have to think about things that no matter what we implement, there is no silver bullet when it comes to Web3 security. You know, MPC was, you know, lauded as, you know, MPC is the next greatest thing and it's the holy grail and it's the silver bullet and that's the vulnerability that was announced a few days ago that there's vulnerabilities in the MPC protocol in, you know, three different implementations of it. Um, so I think we need to understand that there is no silver bullet in Web3 and we need to look at the technology in ways in which you have to have as many preventative controls as in place and as many detective controls in place because we're dealing with threat actors like the Lazarus Group from North Korea. We're dealing with a new paradigm of attacks that we haven't dealt with necessarily before. The reason being is, you know, back in the day when you're stealing credit card numbers or you're stealing, you know, PII or NPPI, then you have to go to the black market and you have to sell it. These are bare assets. Once you hold it, it's worth money and it's immutable. The transactions, you can't recall it. So all of the best bad guys in the world are now focusing not necessarily on breaching Target to steal credit card numbers. They're like, well, let me just go steal cash. It's literally robbing a bank and opening up a vault. So we're dealing with some of the most sophisticated threat actors that we've ever seen before because the rewards are there. <laughs> yeah, so. Not to scare everyone. Yeah. I mean, this is just what we're dealing with all day, every day, um, you know, where, where, where we sit. So what are, I mean, so I'm just going to give you all the loaded questions uh, okay. here. So, so it's like, so um, when you think about standardization in this space, where should folks even start? Um, you know, how are you thinking about standardization and how, what are some of the, what are even like the biggest differences that people should be thinking about? So I think with standards, you know, number one, you know, I highly recommend everyone check out, you know, uh, Crypto Consortium, the CCSS. Um, you know, it's a nonprofit organization that has really taken the lead and put out a framework on custody. So, you know, highly recommend if you're not familiar with the CCSS or Crypto Consortium, you should definitely check it out. Um, but I think as a community, I think we need to come together and we need to somewhat self-regulate. Uh, you know, we can't sit around and wait for NIST to come out with the NIST cybersecurity, you know, blockchain framework. We as a community and we as the experts and we as the thought leaders have to come together and we have to set what the standard of security is. You know, with any framework, frameworks are really guidelines 
guidelines or objectives. You know, we're never necessarily going to say this is what you have to do. It's more about the ob the control objectives. You know, we need to have adequate key. I mean, if you look at the frameworks, they're always going to say things like provide adequate safeguards for the protection of keys. Well, what the hell does that mean? Because it's an, it's, it's an always improving, you know, borrowing the, you know, the principles of Kaizen, it's constant improvement. So you never want to come out and say that this is the standards for custody, or this is the standards for tokenization, or this is the standards for X. It's more about how can we set design principles and control principles that will set forth an ever improving, um, you know, framework, if you will. So I think it's about coming together as a community, thought leaders, and really self-regulating ourselves. So as we do that, it's certainly a big challenge. What are, um, what are some of the big sort of risk and security models that folks inside these organizations should be, really be thinking through you know, at this at this moment. You know, the, the biggest threat that comes to mind for me is is insider threats. And it's a really tough conversation to have because nobody is immune to insider threat. There's always gonna be X amount of people that can collude within an organization that could potentially steal assets. And I think you have to get comfortable with that construct. You can set up detective controls to see that something is potentially happening, but the people that are monitoring the detective controls can be part of the collusion. So you have to understand and appreciate that and you have to not be okay with it, but you have to just understand um, and set up as many controls in place. So I would tell most organizations, I think insider threats is probably the biggest threat that right now is, is not necessarily fully addressed in the Web3 world. With that being such a huge risk, I mean, how do, you, how do you even begin to educate folks within your organization on such a thing? I think it's about understanding how a typical threat model would work with an insider. So it's understanding and really going through like a tabletop exercise within your organization and say, okay, if how many people can come together and do something bad and walk through that exercise with your organization. And a lot of it in Web3 unfortunately comes down to trust of the founders. You know, founders are the ones that necessarily in, in many Web3 projects are the ones that hold the private keys. You know, they're sitting on their ledger, sitting in their drawer and it's like, well, it's the founder of the company and I have to trust them. So I think it's about understanding that a lot of the, the organizations that we're dealing with at the enterprise level, um, you know, and this is one of the challenges that I had, you know, when I was working at, at BNY is working with a lot of the Web3 organizations they're not necessarily organizations that have been around for the last 20 years or 30 years. Um, they don't necessarily have the budgets of banks that they can't necessarily go out and hire a team of you know, 30 or 40 information security professionals and hire networking experts and HSM experts and you know, this expert and that expert. They'll go out and they'll hire maybe one or two people and hope that they're a unicorn and you know, understand the full security stack. So I think it's about understanding that the Web3 world today isn't as mature as the enterprise would like. So I think the enterprises also need to understand that it's also their responsibility as well to also uh, implement and um, you know, produce their own technologies and their own safeguards as well. In that education, in, in talking with people across the organization, um, you know, <laughs> explain it to us like, it, like, like you're five, right? So like, what, what is the main thing to kind of get across just from sort of one-on-one standards around here is why you need to be taking uh, this world of DLT that I'm mandated, like, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm on your digital assets team. I need to explain to you that this is a very different world. What is the best way of going about doing that and explaining sort of like, you know, the, dis the distributed nature, the transparency, the transparent nature of DLT? Just the fact that this is decentralized, right? We're in the enterprise world, we're used to, you know, just picking up the phone and calling, you know, the CEO of Google and saying, I don't like that you did this and, you know, we'll have a good conversation with them. There is no CEO of Bitcoin. There is no CEO of Ethereum. Um, so I think you have to understand that, you know, we're dealing with open source technology where there is no control. You don't have the control over, uh, like, just take the, you know, the, the recent shift from, you know, proof of work to proof of stake with Ethereum. Um, you know, Banks didn't necessarily, well, banks did not have the ability to say, well, hold on, let me go through, you know, nine months worth of testing to make sure that, you know, from an interoperability perspective, I fully understand the, what the shift and what the impact will be to our infrastructure. No, it's a bunch of, you know, 20-year-old ETH heads that said, this is the date that we're doing it, and you have to, you know, upgrade your clients, and otherwise you're going to be left behind. So it's about understanding this paradigm shift of not a loss of control per se, but just understanding that there's a shift of control from a decentralization perspective. Amazing. Well, Dave, I really want to thank you for your time. We'll be here all day. Um, we'll go up to the next panel. Thanks. Cheers.